Hi, everyone. Welcome to the How to Fish podcast by Tailored Tackle. I'm your host, Ed Hitchcock. I'm the owner of Tailored Tackle. And today we want to talk about fishing small ponds and lakes. I love this topic because I think that small ponds and lakes are very um, available to the majority of anglers across the U.S. I think that a lot of state parks, um, as well as towns, have awesome, accessible fisheries that are stocked and managed well, um, and they're small enough where there's not really houses on them. It's all kind of within a public area, or maybe it's part of your neighborhood and your HOA runs the pond. Um, And so these are all over the place. I know a lot of the listeners out there fish these, and I'm sure that they have a lot of questions about how to fish them. So today we're going to kind of cover fishing small lakes and ponds um and these can kind of go into a multiple category kind of concept um what i really want to focus on is two distinct categories and that's cold water species and warm water species and so out in the west and over into the midwest so you're thinking like washington oregon california and then Montana, Idaho, even even going down into like Nebraska and North Dakota, South Dakota, there are ponds that are stocked with cold water species, meaning trout. You're thinking of the trout family, and that's typically going to be rainbow trout because they're the easiest to stock. Um, And while these might not be specifically cold water ponds, because cold water is typically lakes that are deeper than, you know, 70, 80 feet. Um, Cold water species can thrive in the right environment, even if it's a little shallow. And so those are kind of cold water ponds in small lakes, whereas warm water ponds, which are much more prevalent um, on the other side of the Midwest, the South and the East. So pretty much everything else besides those Western states um, are going to hold warm water species in their ponds and small lakes. And so that is going to typically be panfish and bass. So what's great about small bodies of water, especially ponds and small lakes that are on like a state park or in your neighborhood, is that they're typically very walkable and accessible, meaning that anybody without a boat can go and walk around and fish around the shoreline. Um, And it's just a more manageable amount of water to fish. What you're going to see through your fishing journey is Larger lakes, while they can sport larger fish, they're they're more challenging to tackle because there's so many options. There's so many places to fish. There's so many lures you can try. There's so many species and it can get really overwhelming, especially if you don't have experience fishing that larger body of water. And so when we go, our team to go and film um, or do photo shoots or whatever, we love fishing small bodies of water in new places um, if it's not in our you know local stomping grounds because it's much more easy to kind of test and learn what you need to be doing there because there's only so many options, right? If you can walk the local pond or the local lake um, within 10 minutes, it's not going to be a super challenging situation to find where the fish are located because within an hour or two, you can cast in every spot possible. And so then it kind of boils down to instead of, you know, locating yourself in the water, it's more about what are you presenting to the fish? Because you know that there's fish there and you can cast to them. So uh, I think this is a great place for those folks that have caught some fish in the beginner arena and are moving into the advanced stage. So we're going to title this an advanced episode um, to really start testing their skills and working a bunch of different lures. Um, This episode is going to focus on using lures. I like using lures and artificial baits when I'm working ponds because you can fish faster. Um, And we'll get into why that is. But I think that this is kind of that next step um, where, you know, you're maybe not totally... um, geared up to be an expert and you're fishing every weekend, but you are, you've caught some fish with live bait and you want to start working different lures into your arsenal and you want to start trying to get a little bit more aggressive. Ponds and small lakes are a great place to start. So let's talk about how you are going to fish in a small pond or a small lake. Um, and I keep saying small pond, I would say just like ponds in general and then small lakes. Uh, so excuse me if I hiccup about that a little bit more, but let's start with a warm water pond slash small lake. I'm just going to call them ponds from now on. This is going to be easier. Um, warm water are going to be very prevalent 
um, in kind of like those neighborhoods that have kind of canals or, you know, your local state park or, you know, just something around town, the city park, a lot of times there's going to be these small kind of like 15 to 20 acre water bodies, and they're typically going to be stocked by either the city, the state, or the Department of Natural Resources in that state, and even some federal stuff too. Um, And so with warm water species, you're looking at kind of fish in a barrel opportunity here. Um, And and that, that, uh, that, that idiom, that, that saying that people have, you know, shooting fish in a barrel, um, it does kind of pertain to fishing in a way where if you have this giant body of water that you've got to tackle, it's just, there's just a lot more variables to consider. But if you condense the amount of water that you have to fish on to a pond, it's going to be a lot easier for you to locate the fish. And I believe personally that finding fish is 90% of the battle and then actually catching them is the other 10%. Um, And that's why I focus so much on teaching, you know, where to find fish and the strategies around presenting your stuff in the right locations. Because if you can find fish, you'll catch fish. You might not catch the most because you're not an expert, but you're going to be on fish if you can get your lure in front of them, um, even if it's not the most ideal lure and it's not the most ideal presentation, you're still going to put yourself in a really good position to be catching fish that day. So that's why I love ponds um, and small lakes, because it takes out a lot of the work that you need to put in um, when you're just getting started, because there's only so many places you can cast in this small pond or this lake. Um, so warm water species and what I'm going to do when I get to a warm water pond or small lake is I am going to be targeting panfish or bass. You can't really do both unless you want to go to live bait. And why I'm preaching artificial baits is because this is a great opportunity for you to try a couple more aggressive approaches because you're kind of in the easy scenario, right? Where if you know that all of these fish are in this 15 to 20 acre area, you have the flexibility, um, to pitch a lot of artificials and have a fun, aggressive day of fishing without feeling like you're going to get skunked because your, your chances of catching fish are much higher than, you know, pitching artificials in a large water body that you've never fished before. And you're, you know, a mile away from where you're supposed to be for that particular lure. So I think this is a great time to work on your arsenal of artificial baits. Um, and I also think that it's just a lot more fun. And then, you know, there is an argument to be had that it might be more productive to use artificials over live bait in these small water scenarios, because the name of the game is covering as much water as possible. You're in a situation where you can cover all of the area in the water body, you know, that day. Um, and so if you can do that and you can move fast, you can pitch, you know, a thousand casts in two to three hours across all of the water body, you're going to narrow into the bigger fish in that water body because you've covered all of it and you're fishing an aggressive presentation. You're setting yourself up for a situation where you could really catch a bigger fish or the biggest fish relative to that body of water. So that's why I'm harping on using artificials in this warm water body. And you're kind of going to break it up into small downsized artificials and larger artificials um, for bass. Uh, so so you've got the smaller things for panfish and you've got the larger things for bass. If I am fishing a pond, a warm water pond, and I want to catch panfish, um, and the, these are going to be anywhere, you know, sunfish, um, bluegill, crappie, uh, sometimes there's perch in there. They typically like deeper water. Um, and sometimes you're going to get the mixed bag species, uh, which are like rock bass and carp and what, whatever. Um, you're not really going to be trying to target them specifically. I'll do a carp episode later. Uh, but that's kind of the panfish kind of realm that you're looking at. And you want to slim down your artificials, but they're still going to be bigger than, you know, your typical, um, live bait setup. So I really like spinners, uh, inline spinners. So brass rattle spinners are really good. And then smaller curl tail grubs. And so anything between like two inches to three inches on a curl tail grub with a jig or a brass rattle spinner, those will kind of 
you know, allow you to target the bigger panfish in that body of water. And they'll also be a great, um, a great setup for bass as well. So in these warm water bodies, it's typically stocked with panfish and bass. Those are the things that can live in water that's, you know, typically averaging around five feet. Um, some of these ponds and small lakes might get up to 10 feet and, and even 20 feet. You never know. But most of the time, they're going to be around five to 10 feet in depth. And those warm water species, panfish and bass, can thrive and sustain themselves in that body of water. And so I like a little bit larger presentation with a small enough hook to catch panfish. Um, but also the artificial profile is big enough where you're definitely going to catch some bass too. Uh, and so those are kind of the lures that I'm focusing on for panfish. Um, another good thing to do in this scenario is to put the curl tail. Oh, the last one I really like is a marabou jig. Um, and so these are those jig heads that have kind of feathers on the side of them. They're marabou um, and they look really puffy. It's like that kind of classic puffy lure that you see in movies that people have on their hats or whatever. Um, those work really well in here because those kind of those puffy lures, they um, they look like they're just a big snowball outside of the water. But once they get wet they bunch up together and they flow kind of like a leech or an insect. Um, and that's very tantalizing and the profile stays right around one to three inches. Um, and then you've just got your hook. And so I love those for panfish and I love them for bass in this situation. So those are kind of the three marabou jigs, brass rattle spinners. Uh, those are those inline spinners with the uh, brass rattling stuff, um, in between the treble hook and the, uh, blade and then a curl tail grub, which we've discussed a lot um, on a small jig head. And so if I'm going to go with like a two inch curl tail grub, I want to throw that on like an eighth, um, actually probably less, a one sixteenth ounce jig head. The hooks are going to be a little bit smaller. The grub's going to be a little bit smaller. And then if I wanted to step it up and go a little bit bigger um, and catch bigger pan fish and definitely try to get into some bass, I'm going to step up to a three inch curl tail grub and that's going to be on an eighth ounce jig head. Um, and so all of this stuff is in our freshwater kit. Um, it's typically sized for kind of that very large pan fish and then bass. So it's not perfect, but if you really wanted to dial into panfish i really like all of the lures that we have in our trout kit for panfish and so i kind of designed it as a hybrid kit it works perfect for trout but like for example one of our guys uh tyler hicks at spilt milk he is a youtuber he's got tons of subscribers he's just an awesome guy um he did a whole video on catching panfish with our trout kit um and he just crushed it just cast over over cast because a lot of these baits that are meant for trout are actually perfectly sized profile wise for panfish as well. Um, and so someday I will come out with a panfish specific kit, but I really like using my trout kit for panfish. Um, and so that's kind of how I'm approaching the lures, uh, for panfish in a warm water body. Um, for bass, I really want you to focus on soft plastics when you are fishing these smaller lakes and ponds. Um, so I really like, um, you know, wacky rigs, I think work really well, which those are those five inch stick baits and they're on an octopus hook with a wacky O ring. Um, I really like those. Uh, I also really like, um, doing kind of like a lighter Texas rig, um, with a finesse worm. And so instead of putting on that big, you know, quarter ounce, bullet weight on top of your extra wide gap worm hook and your and your worm your finesse worm rigged up texas style i really like slimming that down a little bit um and going with like a 1 16th ounce or a 1 8th ounce bullet weight and you you don't even have to put like you don't even have to do it texas style you could do it a carolina rig style where and that'll be less weedy where you would basically take um you'd basically take a egg sinker um, about a foot or two up on your line and then tie on a barrel swivel and then tie on a little leader, maybe a foot or two between the barrel swivel and your hook. 
and rig your warm up Texas style again. And that gives that separation where the weight will get dragged around um, and it'll catch weeds, but the hook generally will not catch weeds because there's that separation. So what I want you to be thinking about when you're fishing in these warm water, small lakes and ponds is that you're going to have a lot of weeds. And so you've got to be able to manage around the weeds. Um, and the weeds are great because it's this great little ecosystem that's getting created for the fish in this warm water body. And it's where all of their bait hang out and all of the little plankton that they feed on um, sit around. And so like these are great, but it just makes it really a pain to cast and retrieve these lures because you've got um, you've got these weeds that are going to get caught on your hook. Um, so what I do like to do when I'm pitching these smaller, um, when I'm pitching these smaller panfish lures, um, especially the marabou jig and the curl tail grub, I like to throw those under a slip float or a clip bobber, um, just to hold them up above the weeds. And so what you'll typically see is like right on the shoreline, you're going to have really thick weeds and then they're going to kind of, um, they're going to kind of decline in size as it gets deeper. Um, and so you're casting over these weeds, but there's still going to be weeds on the bottom. And so you want to kind of present your lure a foot or two up above the weeds, but still a foot or two underneath the water. So a typical situation would be, you know, you cast out it's five feet depth and you've got two to three feet of weeds and then, uh, you know, two to two and a half feet of water between the top of the weeds and the top of the water. Um, and that's kind of the area that you want to be presenting your lure so that you're not getting your lure stuck in the weeds. And that's why a clip bobber or a slip float is really helpful when you're presenting these curl tail grubs or these marabou jigs, because you'll still be able, you still got to pre present them with action. You've got to pull them back. You've got to keep them moving, but they won't be moving in the weeds. They'll be moving right above the weeds. Um, and so that's really helpful because with panfish, you're going to want to have to pause um, while you are presenting this lure on its way back so that the panfish can actually hit it. Um, and if you pause and you don't have a float on top and there's a bunch of weeds, it's going to get stuck in the weeds. So that's a pro tip there on that one for, for the bass. Um, this is why I really like wacky rigs, um, for bass because they do a very gradual drop down. So you can pitch it out there cast it out there and it'll take maybe three to four seconds to get it down to the bottom. Um, and so as it's going down, um, right before it hits the weeds, you can, you know, jig it back up, reel it back up and then let it fall down again. Um, and it just does that classic kind of, you know, cast, let it sink, reel up slack two to three feet. It brings it up, let it drop back down. And then on that pause, that's typically when they're going to hit. And so the wacky rig is a very vertical profile. It's not a horizontal profile. So it's it's vertically presenting itself up and down in the water column. And you and you want that because if you're just presenting horizontally, um, you're going to have to be running your lure faster because you're keeping it above the weeds. Um, and that becomes kind of frustrating, uh, especially if the bass are lethargic and they don't want to hit something moving fast. Um, you can have some issues getting in the weeds. That's why I really like to, when you're, when you are fishing a more horizontal rig, like the Texas rig or the Carolina rig, um, you have to hook the worm up in a way in which the tip of the hook kind of gets sunken into the plastic of the worm so that the the worm glides through the weeds and doesn't get caught on so many. Um, I know I'm talking a lot about these concepts around rigging. Um, it's challenging for me to explain what they look like on here. Um, and so if you go to our website, tailoredtackle.com, and you go to the resource section and click on the library, you can download our how to fish eBooks. Um, there's a bass one, there's a trout one, there's a walleye one. Um, but what I think would be really helpful is the freshwater, just how to fish ebook and if you download that one um you're gonna see all of these rigs and diagrams of what i'm explaining today um and so you'll have kind of a visual explanation of what i'm talking about so i always like to rig them up um in a weedless fashion which is kind of a texas rig fashion when i'm fishing a horizontal presentation and then when i'm fishing vertical it's not that big of a deal so the wacky rig's gonna have its 
its hook sticking out on the top in the middle of that stick bait. Um, and so that's kind of the general concept that I like to do. You can step up a little bit. And so like, let's say that you are fishing a body of water, like a small pond or a small lake that has a ton of dense vegetation, but you know that there's fish in there. So let's say that there's like, you know, 30 yards of lily pads in front of you or a huge bog of weeds. And there's no way you could fish any of these presentations. The best thing to do um, is to fish top water. And so I don't love top water. Top water is very challenging. It requires you to present it very, very um, specifically with, with, with a lot of skill. Um, there's a cadence to it. There is a proper um, push amount, especially if you're fishing like a top water frog, where you it's going to take me a whole episode to explain how to present topwater frogs, but they are helpful in this situation because they're a topwater lure. They float on top. The hooks are on the back. Um, so they don't get caught in all of these weeds. And so some situations will call for this, even if it's not the right time of year. Um, and the best time of year is typically like in, in early spring, um, or late fall when the bass are really aggressively feeding and there's insect hatches that are on the top of the water and they're they're used to feeding on top of the water that's the best time to do top water um lures for bass but you will run into situations where it's like okay i know that there's bass in here but there's no way i could cast anything but a top water because i'm just going to drag weeds in um that's when i do like to use a top water frog and we have a topwater frog in our bass fishing kit um, that I love and I use a lot. Uh, and so basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to find pockets like opening pockets with less weeds or, you know, an open pocket between lily pads that you can work that topwater lure through um, because bass, you got to kind of think like ease of navigation. Bass also want to take the path of least resistance. Like if it is completely dense weeds they can't swim through that so it's not like they're just going to be sitting in a pile of weeds they're going to be sitting in the pockets of open areas within the weeds and they're going to kind of go along the edge of the weeds or the edge of the lily pads and so you're trying to target those areas that are open um and there's they're going to be few and far between but Basically, what you want to do is you want to pop your topwater lure through those areas where you drive it down. Um, and I'm talking about the frog right now. You're going to drive it down by reeling in and pushing your rod tip down on taut line. And that'll drive the frog down like an inch or two and pop back up. Um, and it'll push water in front of it. It'll mimic kind of a frog that's trying to swim away. Um, and then you pause. Um, so you pop, pause, pop, pause. Um, and you want to pause for at least two to three seconds because that's typically when a bass will hit. Um, and when they hit a topwater lure, they typically miss their first time. So the common scenario that I see is, okay, you've popped it, you've paused it, bass comes up and hits it, frog pops back up. Um, they'll go back and hit it again. So the majority of the bass I catch on a topwater frog, um, it's on the second or third hit. And so... That's kind of an expert level thing. I don't want to get too in the weeds, pardon my pun there, um, about topwater frogs right now because that really requires a full episode. Um, but just know that if you do want to fish a body of water that has a ton of weeds um, and there's no way you're going to be able to work your lures through those weeds your best option is to do a top water frog or a top water specific lure um i like frogs the best i think that that's kind of all you need um but yeah and and if you want to learn more about how to fish that top water frog we are going to come out with a podcast on that but um for now just download the how to fish for bass ebook on our website or buy our uh bass fishing kit and that will teach you exactly how to use them so that is warm water ponds uh, strategies around them. Um, now that I've gotten through all of the lures is to just move, keep casting, cast in every single location, walk the pond and change your lures frequently. So what I, how I would attack it is 
okay, I'm going to try this soft plastic approach for bass in this pond. I'm going to target the deepest section and then work into the shallower section. I'm going to try all the different angles. And so I'm basically going to keep walking around the pond and every cast is a new cast. It's a new location. Um, and I'm going to cover every single bit of that water body. Um, I'm going to start deep and I'm going to work in shallow. I think that with ponds, there's only so many places that they can go. You're typically going to be fishing for them in the summer and it's going to be hot. And so I'm going to guess that they're a little bit deeper. Um, but, you know, they could be anywhere. Uh, but so I would start deeper. I would cast deeper. I would work around the pond. I would work around any sort of cover feature. So if there's sunken logs or maybe a boat ramp or maybe like a um, retaining wall, anything that would kind of naturally or unnaturally fall into the body of water that provides shade is going to be an interesting location. But don't worry about it too much because you're targeting everything. You're going to keep walking. You're going to cast every you know five to six steps and you're just going to find what works because the beauty of this small body of water is that you have the luxury of targeting every single section of it within an hour or two. Um, and so you have to try that. Now, I would rotate my lures every like if, if I didn't catch a fish in 25 casts, then I'd try something else. Um, and yeah, that's the name of the game. Just keep moving around, keep casting lures, try different lures um, and try to stay out of the weeds. Um, talking a little bit more about like targeting these cover areas, I would say that your first thing to do is to go and, you know, you want to find the spot on the spot. It doesn't mean that you need to target the entire lake. If you see a fishy place, if you see a place that you're like, well, it looks fishy. I, I'd probably fish there. If I was a bass, I would sit there, um, target that first, of course. Um, and then also just make sure that you are presenting your lures in accordance with the cover. And so when you do see a weed line, you might want to cast horizontally along the weed line so that you're presenting your lure on the edge of the weed line instead of just casting out forward, going to the deepest section and working back right where the weed line starts. Because from previous episodes, you do know that bass and other fish, they stage against transitions. So transitions in depth, transitions in weeds, transitions in cover. Um, and so... Just make sure that you are targeting a bunch of different areas um, and then working them along different transitions and cover and structure. So that's the 101 on warm water bodies uh, for ponds and small lakes. Let's move over to cold water bodies. And if you don't have any cold water bodies um, around you or you listen to this whole thing and you're, you're in the West and you're like, well, this doesn't help me with trout. I want to remind you that fishing is principle based. And so I've become a much better angler by learning to fish for a bunch of different species and then repurposing and reusing those tactics and techniques to target a variety of other species. And so the skills that I've learned in warm water allow me to tackle cold water species better and vice versa. It even goes into salt water. I mean, it's really based on a bunch of core principles that we consistently talk about in this podcast, you know, covering a lot of water, casting, changing lures, um, changing your approach, targeting different areas of cover, positioning yourself along structure. That's all the same for all of these species, whether it's saltwater species, whether it's cold water species in the West or warm water species in the East. It's, it's all the same principles. It's just how you're going to implement them. And so I'm going to talk about a couple different implementation strategies in terms of lures and setup for cold water species. But these principles and these concepts can be used in warm water species and saltwater species. And so this is one of the main rules that I love to think about when I'm fishing cold water species that I think goes great with salt water. Um, and I also use it in, in, in freshwater warm water situations, but it's a two pole approach. So if you are going after cold water species in a pond, um, I think that a two pole approach is super beneficial. I also use this in ice fishing. You're going to, you're going to hear me talk about two pole approaches all the time. So if your state allows you to have two poles to fish with, in cold water bodies, it is super effective to have one that's working some sort of a bait. Um, so whether that's an artificial bait, um, this is where it's going to get confusing. Artificial bait, meaning that it is a still bait. It's not a lure that you're working. It's something that creates visual um, 
enticement as well as scent um, to attract fish to it and commit to it. So um, similar. So, so like I would batch into this category, you know, worms and minnows and leeches. But I also want to batch in, especially for trout, artificial bait, not artificial lures, not artificial soft bait. I want to say things like power bait. So dough baits and corns and mallows, these things that float which is this is where it's really important. So it's an artificial scented thing <laughs> that um, the trout want to come and eat. Uh, and so I like to set up with two poles so that I can present a bait presentation, um, something that would attract fish to come and eat it. And it's sitting still or moving a little bit. Um, and then I would also like to fish an aggressive lure, whether that's with soft plastic artificials or lures, um, they're, they're kind of separated, right? So one I'm letting be, I'm letting it sit out there, whether that's a live or dead or artificial bait. Um, and then the other one is an aggressive approach where I'm casting and retrieving a lure or a soft plastic. And so this is really great for trout because trout, unlike warm water species they're moving around and they don't really hold to cover very well they definitely navigate around structure but it's not like bass or panfish where you're like oh okay here's a weed line i bet there's going to be some on the side of the weed line or oh here's a dock they're probably using it for shade i'm going to cast around this dock trout like to move constantly they're like sharks and they position themselves in the water column according to a bunch of different things that are super complicated that we're not going to get into here but let's say that you're fishing in a cold water pond and its max depth is 20 feet they could be anywhere from two feet of water to 20 feet of water and in that 20 feet of water there could be anywhere from two feet off the bottom to two feet from the surface um so <laughs> you're kind of like oh well <laughs> okay how am i going to narrow down my casting because like Yes, you get to work a smaller body of water and you get to cast in all these different directions. But now you're introducing this new variable where, you know, the the warm water species are typically going to be one to three feet off of the bottom, regardless of how deep they are. Now, these trout could be anywhere between right on the bottom to the top of the water column. And they could be anywhere from the shore to the deepest section. You just you don't know. Um, and so I like to present multiple approaches and cover a lot of water um, and then also kind of set up a trap for them because you just don't know where they're going to be. Um, and so that's where this two pole approach comes in. And so here in Washington state, we have a permit that you can buy for like 15 bucks that allows you to use two poles in ponds and in small lakes. Um, a lot of states allow you to do this. You've got to read your regulations or call one of your Department of Natural Resources officers and say, hey, like, huh, how many poles can I use? Most states have this ability, but definitely double check. Um, so I love to have a two pole approach on this. Uh, and these are the two setups I'm using. I am going to use a trout bottom rig and then I'm going to cast a lure in my other one. Um, so a trout bottom rig would be something like it, it's basically an egg sinker with a bead and that goes to a barrel swivel. And then you've got a leader from that to your hook where you're going to put on your dough bait. And so I know this sounds a little complicated. Again, we've got it in our trout fishing ebook. We've got it in our how to fish ebook on our website. So go and download those. Those are totally free. Um, but what's important with this trout bottom rig is that you're using bait that floats. So power bait will float. Um, a lot of the marshmallows will float. You'll see when you go and you buy it, it'll say whether it's floating or not. Um, don't worry too much about the color or the scent or whatever. They're all kind of designed for trout. They're going to be fine. We'll get into the colors and stuff on like a totally different episode, but just know you put some power bait onto a small hook and then your leader is going to decide how high it floats in the water column. So how much line, so like this, this thing is always going to float. It's always going to float upwards. So depending on how much line you give between the weight and the hook with the bait on it is going to decide how high up it's going to float. So I always like to be up to the top, like, I don't know, one quarter to one third of the water column. If I'm fishing, um, a trout bottom rig with power bait. And so 
I like to use, let's say I'm casting into 20 feet of water, I like to use four to five feet of leader. It's gonna be kind of wonky and hard to cast, but that's the best I can do. Um, you're typically gonna see about 15 feet, maybe 10 feet to 15 feet. There you wanna have like a two to three foot leader. Um, and then you're gonna put a little, uh, a little ball of dough and you're gonna kind of basically wrap it around your hook and ball it up on there. Then you're just gonna cast it out and you're gonna wait and you're gonna try different depths. So you're gonna try the deepest section, then the midsection, then maybe a little bit shallower. And so that one's just gonna sit there. It's gonna sit there really taut. Um, you can use trout dough bait or you can use any of the live bait rigs that we've talked about. Um, when you're in a pond and we're, we're working live bait, um, go back to the live bait episode, but you can use a worm, a minnow, or a leech if it's allowed. A lot of these western states only allow worms, and so I actually prefer power bait over worms when I'm fishing for trout. Um, it's totally situational, but just rule of thumb. If you are in one of those states that doesn't allow live minnows or live leeches, um, I would actually default to power bait over worms, um, but you can use both. They'll be fine. You'll be fine. Um, and just change depth. Uh, and so that is set up and you're casting that out. You're going to let it sit for about, I don't know, somewhere between 10 to 15 minutes, and then you're going to check it. Um, and, and during those 10 to 15 minutes, you're going to keep trying different locations. You're going to move around. And so that's sitting there and that's calling in fish. And you're going to, you're going to try to get a trout by them swimming by them, smelling it, and then moving up and down the water column to go and feed it. Um, and I think you're probably going to catch a little over 60 to 70 percent of your trout on the bottom rig with some sort of bait on it um i don't know why that is uh but i have seen that with my own personal um fishing trips to all of these small bodies of water around the western states is that i catch the majority of my fish on power bait but it is way more fun to catch them on uh lures so that's why i like to do a two-pole approach and some days the lures work better than the power bait so it's great if you can have both of them out there. It keeps you busy. It keeps you having fun. And then it's a lot more rewarding too. You'll see like pitching a lure out there and getting an aggressive trout to hit that lure on its way in and then reeling it in. It's just a little bit more fun than catching them on the baited rig. Uh, so you've got your pole set up with the bottom rig. You got the bait out there um, and you could use a slip bobber for, you know, worms, whatever. Um, but then you're going to be casting lures too on your other, uh, your other rod and reel. And so what I really like for this, again, it's all going to be kind of in that same group as the warm water is we want to be using inline spinners, grubs, and you can use smaller crankbaits, but I would save those for rivers and streams. I really like inline spinners and grubs for small ponds and lakes. And so it's going to be the same exact lure profile and setup as your panfish. So that's what's great about our freshwater kit and our trout kit is that they have a lot of interchangeable dimensions where if you wanted to fish a cold water pond for trout and then fish a warm water pond for panfish, you would use all the same lures. So we are looking at a feather spinner or a rattle spinner. Um, or a vibrating spinner. Um, there's a ton of different types of spinners out there. Uh, again, take a look at our trout fishing ebook if you want to see what these look like, but really it's just inline spinners. Like I haven't seen a huge difference between them all. Um, pretty much all of them work. It kind of depends on what you're feeling. Like, what do you want to catch? Uh, or I mean, what do you want to cast? Um, what looks prettiest to you? Because I, I don't think the trout really care that much. I mean, some days I've seen that, like, you know, I've caught four fish on this, this inline spinner and only one on the other. Maybe it's the inline spinner. Maybe it's not. I like to change them up and try different colors. Cause I have seen some response with that, but really at the end of the day, like whatever you're comfortable with, just cast that inline spinner. I think that there's a, a larger difference between the change in profile. So switching from an inline spinner to a curl tail grub on a jig head, that's where you're going to see a larger difference in catch rates if they're preferring one over the other versus switching your inline spinner from one color to the next. Uh, and so those are the two that I really like. And what we're doing is, is we're just covering a ton of water and we're, we, we've got to think about covering different areas of the water column. This is something that you don't really have to think about with warm water species. So 
if I'm pitching my curl tail grub and I'm going to be using probably a two inch grub, I can use a three inch grub, but a two inch grub with a one sixteenth ounce jig head, I like white and black. Um, if I'm casting that out, I'm, I'm still doing that same process with the warm water where I'm walking around the pond and I'm casting in different locations. But what's different here is that I might cast in the same spot three times. And I recommend you do this because I want to cover different sections of the water body. So water body column. Uh, column means vertical. So I'm talking about the area between the top of the water and the bottom of the water. And then that that's kind of like the difference when I'm saying the column. Um, and so with trout, they could be anywhere in that column. So each cast is actually kind of a different cast. So just because I casted straight and reeled it in doesn't mean I covered all of that area because they could be in the bottom third, the middle or the top third. And so when I'm casting in a specific cast into one location in front of me, let's say I'm facing 12 o'clock and I'm casting forward. My first cast is going to be I'm going to cast it all the way out. I'm going to let it drop all the way to the bottom. I'm going to wait. Probably it'll probably take you four to five seconds. And then I'm going to gradually retrieve it in. So it stays on that bottom third of the water column. Um, and, and it's just kind of a slower pace. Uh, you don't have to change the pace rapidly because you've already let it drop down when you're using that weight with the curl tail grub. Um, but then I'm going to cast again and I'm going to cut that wait time in half and I'm gonna work it through the middle of the water column. And then I'm gonna cast again and I'm gonna start retrieving quickly. I'm not gonna let it drop at all. And I'm gonna work it through the top third of the water column because they could be anywhere positioned on that water column. And if you just cast it out and you retrieved it through one portion of the water column, you could have easily passed by a trout that's 10 feet up above you that didn't see it because this is another thing you gotta keep in mind is that trout feed upwards. They very rarely feed downwards. They'll do it, but like they very much prefer to feed upwards. And so your lure not only needs to pass by them, but it needs to pass by them at least, you know, one to maybe five feet above their head for them to actually see it and go and make an attempt at it. So if you were to cast right into where a trout is located, but he's in the middle of the water column and you reeled it back on the bottom, you're going to have a very marginal shot at getting that trout to even look at your lure because they're looking upwards and they're feeding upwards. So it is beneficial to not just cast one area and then cast to another area. It's more beneficial to cast in all three sections of that water column in that area and then move and then move and then move. Um, but you're still trying to move. You're still trying to work it. And so because you have this extra effort to cover multiple sections in the water column, that's why a two pole approach works well here because it's going to take you longer to work kind of like a 50 yard stretch than it would in warm water and that's why it's great to have your dead stick um your your baited line that's just sitting out there um it's good to have that while you're trout fishing because it's going to take you you know maybe 10 to 15 minutes to really work the area um by your baited line and it's still going to be in visible distance. And then you're going to go back and check your baited line. Hopefully you had a bite somewhere in between there. Um, and then you're going to move your next 50 yards over. So that is how I'm approaching a cold water pond. And so let's kind of just go back to the theories around this. Um, because the theories really work for both. The number one rule is covering water. You are you're in such a great situation to figure out every single square inch of this water body. You should be able to cover it in two to three hours. And so take advantage of that. You shouldn't be just sitting there and casting in one place and hoping that a fish comes by. You have the opportunity to walk the whole thing and cast and basically check off your list. Hey, like. 80% and actually 90%, usually 90% of the water isn't going to hold the fish regardless of the size. So when you find that 10%, that's going to be awesome. And it's very easy to do when you're working a small body of water. So stay mobile, keep walking, cast lures, um, and cover that full water body. And then once you find the fish, you find their pattern. Let's say that they're in this one little specific spot. Well, then great. Hit it hard with live bait or hit it hard with your lure um, and focus on that until you till you start running dry. Um, and so movement mobility is the name of the game. The second thing is working the right lure for the right fish. 
and switching them up. Do not be afraid to switch your lure every, you know, 20 to 30 casts and try something else. But I still want you to stay within the realm of reason in terms of your lures. So make sure, like we talked about with the lure episode and the live bait episode that were previous to this, that the profile of the lure matches the catch, right? And so, like, you're, you're not throwing a seven inch lure out there in hopes that, uh, that a panfish is going to hit it, right? And so, like, make sure that the profile of the lure is adequate for the species that you're targeting. And so, smaller two to three inch lures for panfish and trout, larger three to let's say seven or eight inch lures um artificial bait um not artificial bait artificial soft plastics um for bass um and so let's stay away from crankbaits in ponds and small lakes uh it's not to say that you can't catch fish on them but the majority of small water bodies are going to have dense weeds so you're going to have a hard time fishing those crankbait lures with treble hooks because they're going to be constantly getting hung up in weeds and a lot of them dive to a certain level. And so if you're fishing one that dives seven to eight feet and you're fishing in four feet of water, you're going to be hitting the bottom all day long and you're just going to be picking up weeds. So that's why I like smaller profile lures like inline spinners, curl tail grubs and marabou jigs uh, when you're wanting to catch trout and uh, panfish because you can work them fairly easily in one to five feet depth of water and position them in the water column so they're not getting hung up on weeds so that's kind of what i'm going for for panfish and trout and then when i'm working bass i really like soft plastics rather than large flashy lures because the soft plastics give you the ability to work that lure somewhere in the water column so you can avoid these weeds and you can go fast or slow. You can rig them up in a variety of ways so that it'll be tailored to that pond or small lake. Um, and you're not kind of pigeon held into the way a lure specifically works, whether that's kind of like a spinner bait or um, a crankbait where the lure is determining how you fish it because the water body might not respond well to that. You might not have the depth. You might not have the clearance between the cover. Um, and so what's great about soft plastics is that you can fish them um, in a variety of rigs and setups where it can be ultra light, where it barely goes down a foot or two, or it can be fished fast, a bit deeper. Um, you can really work them around a lot of the challenges that ponds and small lakes have. Um, and so flexibility in your lure selection is important, but flexibility within reason, right? Um, and then kind of the last thing is that two pole approach. So take advantage of situations where you can have live bait on one rod and reel and then a lure on the other. Um, a lot of times you'll be able to catch fish on both, but sometimes one will work better than the other. Um, it totally depends on a bunch of different factors and you're never going to be able to conceptualize all of those factors. So it's really nice to just have two tests running out there. Um, you don't have to be the expert walking in saying, okay, they're going to be hitting on live bait or they're going to be hitting on this artificial lure. You have the luxury of fishing both of them and seeing what works. And oftentimes both will work. And so you're doubling your catch rate. So have a two pole approach where you can. So that's all. Um, we're definitely going to get to a lot of these topics more in depth, especially the individual lures and the individual species and even some of the techniques going into more depth. But I think that this is a really good, well-rounded episode on, OK, I've got a local pond. I want to go catch some fish. How do I do that? I'm hoping that I can give you all the tools to do that in this episode. So thank you so much for listening. It would really, really help us out if you guys left a review um, on Apple podcast. I know the other ones don't. So if you have Spotify, don't worry about it, but it would be super helpful if you guys did that. It'll help more people like you that are learning how to fish, find our podcast and I can teach them as well. And that's what I'm here to do. So thank you so much for listening. Tight lines.